<clears throat> hello good morning can you guys hear me please type one if you can hear me so this is class eight or nine This is class 9, right? Am I correct? Or 8? Okay. Okay. Good. So, uh, are you sure it's not a heater? Huh? So we're going to say Dr. Sama and we're going to say class 9 and we are on our way and we're being recorded as usual okay so let me just check that you guys can see me that you can see the slides that I am sharing and you can also hear me well say yes to the three yes 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 okay nice okay uh sorry about yesterday I got mixed up i was preparing for the class and i was under the impression that it's 6 p.m um that's okay we're making it up today or this morning anyway so what is it that we're having today or this morning we're having again candied by Voltaire perhaps you were given by not having the class on on Sunday uh, you, you you guys were given the opportunity to perhaps go and um, I mean complete the reading of the, this novella which I hope you did so how many of you have finished remember i said that it uh, it's easy uh, i mean to understand and digest it's not that big um and it's also funny and comic um so who has finished reading it Mm -hmm. Abir is saying not yet I am uh, in chapter 23 yeah yeah that's interesting anybody else okay so um, saying nothing means that you haven't um, I mean done any reading or perhaps you're um starting or halfway through okay anyway uh, the reason why i'm asking is because i mean if you um if you have read or you're halfway through you can always connect what we say to what uh, to your readings and you even can come up with your own original exam you don't have to subscribe to the examples uh, that we give and this is perhaps the beauty of reading you you can think for yourself you can come up with your own conclusions and ideas um okay anyway so it's candide again and like we said candide, uh, candide is um, a, a product of the 18th century and it is or it was written by voltaire um, so when you talk about the uh, when you talk about Candide, you have to kind of um, get to know about the age in which uh, in which it was written, which is the 18th century, and you also need to to know a bit about the author himself. I know this is 
autobiographical and um, it's not the kind of reading that we normally um, advocate and promote we promote and advocate uh, a reading of the novel independent of its age and independent of its author but this time around um, uh, the experience would be different because we're I mean the this novella is um, Voltaire's statement uh, against the 18th century and its uh, uh, prevailing philosophies as we have seen and as we're going to see further today so uh, it wouldn't harm this time around per perhaps this time around only it wouldn't harm a uh, people get um, some knowledge about the age and about um, Voltaire. Uh, what is it that we we said about the 18th century? W what what are some of the philosophical landmarks of the 18th century? We spoke about um, the idea of science, the idea um, of rationalism, the fact that um, uh, the philosophies at the time were uh, either um, rationalism or empiricism. Uh, with with a third strand or, or with with a third school that that, that tries to reconcile uh, the two, and also talk about the um, the benevolence of God, the fact that we live in um, in a world that is um, I mean uh, controlled um, by a, a benevolent deity or a benevolent God. Um, I'll talk about that uh, perhaps in more details in a minute. We also um, need to know who Voltaire is uh, because um, again uh, when you know about Voltaire you um, uh, there is a great deal that gets unlocked for you in terms of ideas and in terms of philosophies. Spoke about Voltaire and we said that, that he is a French philosopher and um, he is also an empiricist. Empiricist means um, uh, he believes uh, in science and he believes in sense experience. Um, uh, the idea of having a, um, a supernatural deity that controls the world um, and that is smi smiling on, on, on people and uh, perhaps directing them uh, uh, and, uh, in the right direction and, uh, and uh, this deity is, be is benevolent and stuff. These are ideas that um, Voltaire does not accept. Again, being empiricist means that he uh, does not believe in the supernatural and the supernatural uh, would be uh, the idea of religion altogether where there is uh, people talk about miracles people talk about uh, scriptures and revealed and revelations um, that uh, are not according to him and others are not rational and are not uh, you cannot subject them also to uh, sense experiences especially the idea um, of miracles uh, um, okay so this was uh, a very brief uh, introduction so the title is very significant um, it's Candide um, and Candide, the word uh, Candide, for those uh, who speak French, they know that Candide means uh, candor and it means uh, uh, forthcomingness and uh, being honest, being frank, uh, being uh, sometimes uh, brutally honest about something. Okay, so this is the title. Uh, and the, the, as you have seen, and as you have read and as you will uh, read the whole um, novella is about this idea of candidness 
this idea of candor, candor, frankness. Uh, lots of people in this work are very uh, candid and are very uh, honest and they are even brutally honest about uh, what happened to, to them. You have, um, you know, you have graphical description of um, stuff, whether this stuff is uh, religious, uh, um, whether this stuff is, uh, you know, uh, has to do with the misfortunes and suffering uh, and all these kinds of things. Um, uh, however, the subtitle uh, is optimism. So the title is Candide, while the subtitle is optimism. And obviously optimism is not a translation of the word Candide. So optimism um, is not. Optimism uh, also is very significant. Um, when you see the subtitle, you get uh, perhaps um, to to think of uh, this novella as having as pr promising optimism, giving us examples of. Um, uh, examples and situations where people can feel optimistic about life and about the world. This is not true. Actually, the the entire book is uh, is an attack on optimism and those who believe uh, in optimism, as we have seen. Um, so it's Voltaire, and we know about Voltaire already this philosopher, this empirical philosopher who only believes in what he sees and what he hears uh, and what he uh, kind of experiences, okay? Um, Candide uh, and uh, the word Candide has to do with honesty with yourself and with others, being brutally honest about what happens to you and what you do to others. And optimism, like I said, uh, it's not what we get in in the novel what we get in the novel or what we get in and and this book uh, is the opposite of optimism so more or less it's a challenge um, um, the book is a challenge or is challenging um, the idea of optimism not promoting it uh, obviously the, the writer is not promoting optimism he is uh, actually challenging those who believe that we live in the best of all possible worlds uh, that all is uh, all is good and and this other uh, and uh, in, you know all those optimistic tenets that we we have seen in uh, in this world spoke about the aims of the book and we said that among um, those aims were um, this close literary analysis of this work. This work is written, of course, in prose. <coughs> so um, we're, we're doing a close reading of the novel. Again, um, in order to perhaps appreciate Voltaire and any other writer for that matter, you need to uh, kind of um, uh, dissect the novel and try to break it down to its basic components not influenced by what other people are saying about the novel. So your starting point, like I always say, would be with the text. You read the text and then you make the transition to the second resources. Again, that would be difficult and different in Candide because Candide is rooted in the age it was uh, uh, written. Um, uh, among the aims was the uh, idea of uh, examining the function of both uh, real and metaphorical travels in Candide. Candide is uh, a book um, about a book where there is a great deal of travel and traveling. Okay, so you you need to think: Is it mere traveling that we're having? Is it Remember, I, um, if it's mere traveling that we're having, we're going to kind of um, compare it to um, 
what we do nowadays the having a vlog where you you have a cam and you move around and uh, you capture uh, scenes and scenery and places and you go to other countries uh, for the, perhaps the mere the mere pleasure of capturing what happens but there is actually no philosophy behind it. you don't talk about philosophies when it comes to, to vlogs so is indeed another uh, vlog but uh, in the 18th century where it's it's mere traveling from one place to another the answer is no there is more to Candide than just the traveling that people are engaged in. There is uh, uh, philosophies that run um, parallel to the actual journeys. So um, you have a number of levels. The surface level would be the physical um, journey that people um, um, embark on, moving from one place to another, from one continent to another from one country to another and the other level would be the uh, metaphorical um, and the philosophical journeys uh, journeys that run in parallel when when i say metaphorical and when i say philosoph philosophical i mean that there is a great deal of lessons that people learn there is a great deal of insights and realizations and epiphanies uh, that they come out with okay so this is happening in uh, this uh, book we have a great deal of uh, metaphorical and philosophical journeys in involved and they run parallel to the actual or to the physical journeys um, this brings us to the idea of antecedents and whether um, you know Voltaire was one of a kind or was he perhaps following the footsteps of uh, previous writers in presenting the journey with its different levels the metaphorical and the physical and yes um, Candide uh, is not the first of its kind when it comes to journeys when it comes to uh, the, to this kind of literature uh, where uh, a number of characters uh, are involved or are engaged in travels yeah we do have that um, since Plato if you're familiar with Plato Plato happens to be um, one if not uh, yeah, one of the greatest if not the greatest um, a Greek philosophers and um, he was uh, you know um, typical of uh, philosophers he was trying to make sense of the world and he is known also for his um, you know rationalism he is a rationalist um, and uh, an idealistic philosopher where the focus is normally on um, the idea and the original idea and the original form um, so he started this line or this uh, line of uh, tradition where there is um, you know that this idea of I mean moving somewhere and looking for um, a place a perfect place a perfect place in terms of the the um, system of government in terms of uh, uh, dealings among people and he uh, he had that place um, or this imagined place in in a book that he has created and has written or uh, which is called uh, the Republic so the Republic is a very famous uh, piece of work philosophical as it is and it is basically about a perfect world a world where there is no uh, perhaps dishonesty there is uh, um, no uh, double dealings and it's perfect in terms of education in terms of uh, um, equal opportunity and all these kinds of things so again I'm answering the question 
that Candide uh, is not one of a kind. It has uh, pr uh, precedents and it has uh, antecedents. Okay, so Voltaire, what is uh, special about Voltaire? Um, Voltaire, like we said, is a philosopher um, and he is also, he has this uh, sense of humor. He is, he has an acute sense of humor um, and he, he, he knows how to use it in, in his work. Uh, and, and Candide is a, is a case in point. He he does just that in Candide. Candide, for all the, the, the misery and the suffering that it that it projects, is full of uh, funny uh, situations. But uh, I mean the fun here is not mere irony or mere fun. It is meant to um, get messages across. So uh, he is French, like we said, and um, his father was, you know, a government official. He, uh, he, he wasn't mm, a high profile uh, government official. And his mom was uh, from the nobility. She was a noble lady. Um, uh, I mean, he trained in languages. He he, um, he knew a number of languages, and like I said the other day, knowing languages um, happens to be very important if you're a writer because you, you you know how to manipulate the word. You know the value of of every and each word. So what are the different ways in which the idea of journeying operates throughout the text? So the text here, of course, is Candide. <coughs> like we said, we have several kinds of travel. Um, and some of these travels are direct, are physical, moving from one um, uh, town to another, from one country to another, uh, one continent to another even. Um, and of course, um, like I said, uh, running parallel to those physical uh, journeys, you have the metaphorical and the philosophical journeys. So the, the direct or the physical journeys would involve uh, people like Candide, the titular character or the titular hero, the one who gives uh, his name to the work or to the book, uh, and his lady love, Cunegonde. She also impacts on, on journeys, um, and we also have um, digressions from uh, these two main journeys by uh, other minor characters. They have uh, those uh, other minor characters have their own uh, journeys, and the uh, all of the physical journeys interlock together, and. Um, we come up with uh, some kind of uh, perception that this is all meant to uh, to present a challenge to the ideas of Pangolus. Pangolus happens to be um, the tutor of Cunegonde and Candide and he accompanies them uh, and he moves around with them and he um, it, it, it's not that he is their tutor uh, he, he is there in in the book in order to represent the philosophy of optimism he is an uh, an overwhelmingly optimistic guy and he is presented as a philosopher who promotes uh, the philosophy uh, or the idea of optimism um, to the extent that he uh, twists situations so that uh, um, uh, an element of optimism can come out of it even at the bleakest of moments at the dark the darkest of situations he he would come out and say this is all 
uh, um, good this is all partial evil and uh, um, it means nothing in the grand scheme of, of, of th things this is partial evil but there is universal uh, good uh, and goodness that you guys fail to see because of how because you're in incompetent as human beings because you have limited knowledge as a human being uh, and of course uh, when we speak about Bangalus we speak about those who are behind him he is a mere representation of um, of the philosophies uh, and the philosophers of the time who also believed in this idea of absolute optimism um, um, those who believed in the idea that um, all is uh, taken very good care of uh, by a benevolent governor by a divine mechanic by a benevolent uh, deity or god so uh, again Bangalus would be representing that and again all the journeys the physical journeys that the different characters embark on whether we're talking about the main characters Kurnagund and Candide or uh, the uh, minor characters journeys like those of uh, the um, uh, Kakambu and the others uh, all of this are unified in their attack and challenge uh, on and to the philosophies uh, uh, of Pangolus and behind, uh, behind him of course would be the uh, philosophies of the age so the routes and destinations of all of these interconnected travels constitute an absorbing mix of ideas and debate right again um, so there is a running, a running parallel like we said the intellectual journey that follows the succession of challenges to Pangolus ideal of optimism Am I making sense so far? Okay, good. Um, again, um, the text is not innocent, like I said. Uh, not innocent in the sense that there is uh, philosophies uh, behind it. Again, to read the text as mere uh, as mere uh, as a mere vlog or as a mere uh, travel writing uh, piece that does not have a philosophy uh, behind it would be um, you know uh, it would be misunderstanding and mis mis uh, a misconstruction and a misconstruing uh, of the text. Um, at the core of the journeys that we have we have this uh, idea of the wanderer you, you always have a wanderer who is driven by some sort of philosophical quest and this is also not new whenever you have this philosophical quest then there is a quest of it. quest means that people are in search of something and this idea of quest is so um, you know so prevalent in literature and in cultural studies and cultural discourses in general and uh, uh, we have seen examples um, if, if you're familiar with Homer the very famous uh, Greek poet you know that he wrote um, the Odyssey and the Odyssey is about this quest I mean, it's uh, it's a physical journey. I mean, Odysseus, the um, the main character in the Odyssey, uh, is coming back from uh, perhaps from from war uh, after spending ten years. I mean, he's going to spend perhaps another ten years 
uh, trying to um, go home and of course on the journey he's going to meet the different people from different cultures and, and there is going to be a great deal of talk about um, their cultures and what they do excuse me what they do and what they don't there is going to be also a bit of philosophy to 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 the journey so you have the odyssey as having those kinds of wanderers uh, yani one of the early examples of the idea of quest and the idea of the wanderer and we go down uh, through the ages and we'll have other examples until perhaps we reach the uh, 17th and the 18th century and we will um, have wanderers um, in in the novels of the time uh, i'm sure you're familiar uh, with uh, for example um, daniel defoe's uh, Robinson crusoe Robinson crusoe is also a, a, a journey of an english man who leaves england behind and goes out to explore and the next thing you know is that he is stranded on an island and he lives there for perhaps uh, 20 years he has to deal with the wild animals and, and the natives and he has to build himself a house he, he has to learn how to hunt and fish so that he can survive this is also a quest this is also a journey um, also you have even a style of novels that is called uh, picaresque novels where at the core of the picaresque novel you have the picaro the picaro is also uh, somebody who wanders and uh, leaves uh, one place to another uh, in search of a quest he can be a rogue he can be uh, uh, dishonest but he embarks on on a journey and out of uh, the encounters of peop uh, with people from different cultures he um, has insights and he has realizations and epiphanies you can also think of Gulliver's Travels by uh, Jonathan Swift who, who, who didn't do uh, Gulliver's Travel everybody did it obviously and you, you have seen uh, Gulliver and uh, I mean the places that he went to uh, and the um, the philosophies that he was projecting and uh, also in that he was receiving and the uh, the nuggets of uh, nuggets of wisdom that he got out of dealing with people f from uh, other countries even animals right uh, we're familiar with Gulliver uh, Gulliver's travels and, and what happened over there even in the uh, the 20th century the 19th century we had the idea of uh, the the wanderer um, uh, l l for example you have the if you're familiar with french literature they have uh, the character of the flaneur or, or uh, the flaneuse flaneuse would be uh, the female flaneur um, and the flaneur is obviously uh, a stroller somebody who travel i mean perhaps goes around uh, uh, within the city or the town and he uh, as much as he sees stuff and perhaps uh, um, I mean satisfies his senses uh, he also um, thinks thinks deeply about what he sees and um, he is an observer and he's not a detached ob ob observer he, he he is involved in what happens and he uh, uh, tries to interpret stuff in a philosophical way so again um, Candide is not without precedence. Uh, Candide is not without, <coughs> um, you know, uh, traditions that uh, that it falls back on. It goes all the way back to Plato and others. So um, again, uh, the the uh, the big idea would be that this is travel literature. Uh, travel writing and traveling uh, travel writing literature uh, and uh, of course you know no uh, 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 when you have travel writing um, you have a, a bit of traveling of course um, and uh, normally in travel writing you normally have description and and, and, and narration and uh, the description or or the narration is 
also um, by um, uh, an individual or a group uh, of people and they are uh, uh, voyaging or moving from one place to another perhaps I forgot to also mention that um, um, we also have uh, Geoffrey Chaucer's uh, The Canterbury Tales The Canterbury Tales is also one of those uh, uh, travel uh, literature uh, pieces where you also have people um, going on on pilgrimage and uh, in, in order to perhaps while away the time they engage in 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 tales and those tales were uh, poetic um, I mean the, the list is so big and you know, if uh, it can uh, it would need a whole class talking about the antecedents and the precedents and and this is uh, something that we cannot afford we don't have the luxury to uh, have a whole class on on that um, okay so um, uh, observing those um, travel writing stuff critics came up with uh, a number of observations they said that whenever people engage in those kinds of travels whether those are physical or metaphorical whether they are actual uh, travels or perhaps imagined uh, uh, you normally have one of three things uh, there is always to be there is always going to be this comparison between the world those travelers come from uh, with the world that they uh, tra they are traveling to and that would uh, make them sometimes make negative uh, and even racist remarks and judgments and assessments on the host culture the culture that they are visiting this uh, happens sometimes uh, some other times uh, by comparing what they see uh, new uh, to what they have left behind sometimes they are honest enough uh, forthcoming and transparent enough and they start to recognize flows in their own societies it's only when they compare what they see in uh, in the places that they travel to they start to compare and they come up with flows I mean they say yeah um, uh, we would love our country to do like um, what we have seen um, and those guys have best practices that we that our countries uh, and our towns uh, should uh, adopt and embrace um, sometimes uh, traveling to those new cultures and to 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 those new places may um, give them the opportunity I mean the travelers to kind of reflect on the universality of human experience the fact that we are all human beings they have this we have the same concerns uh, we have the same hardships and tribulations and this is also nice and this is uh, to I mean you get insights I mean uh, that uh, you don't live alone in the world for example that you're not the only uh, uh, species uh, that you're not superior to anybody else I mean we are all obviously equal and traveling to these places may uh, prove that for you when you get back perhaps when you write about it you have this measure of humility it you have humility humility means that you humble down uh, you, you I mean those uh, arrogant uh, 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 approaches um, are perhaps minimized you you get to know that there are other people who are populating the world and they uh, uh, may even be better than yourself okay so it's only uh, when you travel and see if you're uh, uh, staying at home in your country and you don't get to know about other people um, you are uh, normally under the false impression that you are the best 
um, in everything okay this is also um, and we spoke about that already the idea of uh, what we're what we're seeing in Candide would be um, or there is an element of utopia to it remember when they went to I mean Candide and uh, the others to um, uh, El Dorado in, in Latin America it's this land where gold uh, gold means nothing uh, people are happy they live uh, beyond the average um, age um, and they seem to be happy with their life and um, there is no injustice and um, so this is uh, this has always been the dream of, of all the writers uh, down through the ages to have a perfect world uh, where uh, there is equal opportunity, where there is no uh, racial discrimination, where people, where there is no private ownership, we share everything, we share all the facilities and everything. Um, we said we spoke last time, we spoke about two examples, we spoke about Thomas More, the um, um, English uh, philosopher and he said that he wrote uh, um, a whole work and he titled it Utopia um, and he was promoting the ideas the idea of tolerance and the idea of uh, equal opportunity when it comes to education and also the idea of communism the fact that uh, we all share the same facilities um, um, it's a it's a society that has no room for private ownership. Uh, of course, this was uh, um, uh, was very theoretical and was quite impractical uh, to the extent that after him um, there will uh, come or there would come uh, a lot of writers who are going to. Uh, kind of attack uh, the concept um, and they would make fun of the idea uh, by uh, parodying it pa uh, and we spoke about parody before we said a parody is uh, a work that you write uh, uh, in order to make fun of uh, an ideal or uh, another work that promotes certain ideas. so you make fun by presenting uh, perhaps the same characters but they are engaged in in uh, um, you know comic situations so again the idea or the aim would be uh, to attack the utopian text so this is this has been uh, put together under the title of this utopia this utopian literature is a literature is a kind of literature that uh, would parody um, uh, um, a utopian uh, text uh, uh, by making fun uh, of the perhaps the char presenting the characters in uh, an exaggerated uh, manner in an exaggerated manner again the aim being to uh, expose this kind of literature and say this is this is not happening uh, this is uh, all uh, you know kind of uh, this is not true and uh, and that w uh, and uh, uh, and not practical um, in terms of genre we would say that Candide is a philosophical tale so tale story and philosophical philosophical means that um, again running parallel to the physical journeys there are metaphorical and philosophical journeys um, where um, we uh, expose or we un we uncover the philosophical underpinnings of the journey so the journey can be superficial and physical but the writer has something deeper uh, in mind uh, okay like uh, we
we see in Candid. Physical journeys, but we have um, challenges to uh, the uh, to the philosophies and the ideas of optimism. Um, people also say uh, that um, this is satire at at its best. Satire is also uh, a kind of writing that was actually uh, very popular at the time. Satire would mean that you're mocking something or someone, that you're making fun of something or someone. Um, <coughs> not for the sake of making fun or um, you're making a statement by using satire. Um, you are uh, perhaps um, ridiculing uh, certain institutions in in the country because they, you think that they are not functioning, they are bad, they are corrupt. So there is um, a, a kind of a, a, a reformative streak to it. I mean, they don't do it. They they don't engage in in, in comic and funny situations just for the sake of it. There is a corrective uh, measure to it. They are doing it in order to correct uh, uh, society, in order to expose the ills and evils of society. So, uh, do we have that? Yes, we have that. Um, um, it is, uh, I mean, Candide is a satire, and it it, uh, it ridicules um, and mocks the feelings of individuals and institutions um, and the whole society as we we see. Uh, what is sef different, uh, perhaps, would be that this is indirect satire. Um, in straightforward satires, you normally have the author interfering. You have authorial voice, and the author is always there, sticking labels, giving you directions. He doesn't give you the opportunity to judge for yourself. But with Voltaire, I mean, he gives you the situations and leaves it, leaves, uh, and he leaves it all to you to come up with your own assessments and your own judgments. And this is what is beautiful about him. So, is it satire? Yes, it is satire. But what kind of satire? It is an indirect satire. Why? Because um, Obviously, uh, Voltaire only asks questions. He doesn't provide answers. He leaves it all to the reader to come up with his own answers. Okay. Yeah, I know that you have taken that. Yeah. Yes, I'm just reminding you. And then I'll move to the... Uh, Okay, so satire is not very far away from uh, the idea of irony. Um, irony, irony means that you're also uh, presenting situations, uh, you're putting stuff against each other so that people can feel the irony of the situation. And uh, lots of critics are saying that uh, the idea of using irony is also meant to uh, perhaps flatter the, uh, the, the reader. So irony operates uh, uh, um, on, 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 on the idea that uh, there are things that the, the writer and the reader knows that are denied the character himself or herself. So the character doesn't know as much as uh, the reader knew as much as the writer knew. And this is where the irony exists. So um, how does the reader uh, deal with that? The reader feels flattered that he knows more than the character himself. But this is a strategy and this is a tactic that uh, some writers uh, resort to and uh, Voltaire happens to be one of them. Um, again, we move to uh, the name, and we said that 
um, Candide is the name of the main character the so Candide is a character who gives his name to uh, the book um, in, um, in this case we call him a titular protagonist or a titular ca character and uh, uh, Candide as presented is a naive uh, character uh, na I wouldn't say naive as uh, I would say credulous well, if you if you're too innocent if you haven't gone outside uh, if you don't know about uh, the ways of the world so you're more or less credulous and you uh, believe what other people are saying and of course he was under the influence of his private tutor and uh, you normally um, I mean especially if you're in uh, in your formative years um, I'm not talking about university I'm talking about uh, perhaps uh, I mean secondary and elementary and um, intermediate school you normally have your teachers are the sole proprietor of truth I mean whatever they say I, I mean uh, this happens with us I mean back home whenever you have uh, a son or a daughter and their teacher uh, tells tells them something they come and you try to say and uh, listen you're pronouncing the word in a in an incorrect way I mean they say no uh, uh, they say no I'm um, the teacher says it this way I said I know I also know no no my um, uh, what I'm trying to stress here is the idea that uh, he was under the influence of his teacher and his teacher Bangalus used to tell him that um, uh, this is what he used to teach them that we live in a perfect world and that we're uh, this is the best of all possible you wouldn't uh, this is the best of all possible worlds you wouldn't have um, you know uh, imagined uh, a better world um, um, uh, this whole business of optimism that we've been talking about uh, so Pangolus like we said is the inexhaustible spokesman of on behalf of optimism uh, um, and all uh, of the main characters in the course of their journeys test to the very limits uh, Pangolus creed uh, this philosophy I mean okay um, we uh, also spoke about the idea that um, Candide is also based on and is inspired by the philosophies uh, of the time and uh, that's why I'm saying that it's not an innocent uh, piece of work um, so um, w we're asking is is Candide trying to kind of promote the ideas of the age uh, at the core of which uh, is the idea of optimism no actually he was attacking and he was challenging um, these ideas especially the idea of optimism so who was promoting these ideas who of the philosophers uh, were promoting these ideas we had um, Leibniz and Leibniz happens to be German and we have uh, Alexander Pope uh, who wrote um, a whole poem essay on man to uh, kind of defend this idea of optimism to defend the uh, I mean the justice of God the fact that we live in in a world uh, controlled by a, a benevolent God and there is justice but it's it's only that we're limited and we can't see that so um, the two philosophers if I can call uh, of course um, Alexander Pope a philosopher the two philosophers that we have uh, um, that were uh, promoting this idea of optimism um, uh, this idea that there is nothing wrong with the world it's only us that are limited uh, in terms of uh, you know in terms of knowledge and ability uh, there were uh, Leibniz like I said the German and Alexander Pope the English okay so Leibniz uh, philosophy uh, Leibniz is by the way 
is um, uh, is a rationalist. He's a rationalist philosopher, and when we talk about rationalism, we talk about logic. Uh, it's all mental. I mean, you calculate everything in your mind, and then up, uh, then you come up w with your conclu uh, with conclusions. This is called uh, empiricism. Uh, I'm sorry. This is called uh, um, rational philosophy, and we also call uh, call it idealistic philosophy. And it goes all the way back to Plato. Okay, so the idea would be that you have a number of premises, you put them together, and you come up with a conclusion. This is all logic. Okay, uh, uh, logical. Um, th it means that it has to do with the mind, but it doesn't have any bearing on uh, on the ground. Sometimes whatever is not uh, whatever is rational does not coincide with whatever is practical and pragmatic and this is the problem with those guys with Leibniz and others and those rationalist philosophers he was a rationalist and he would give you um, a logical argument that starts with premises he would say w what is his uh, logical argument he says um, do we agree that God is all-powerful, omnipotent, uh, people would say, yes, but this is the first premise. Do we agree that God is uh, omniscient, omniscient means, means all-knowing, and people say yes. So from premise one, omnipotence, and from premise two, omni omniscience, we come to the conclusion that uh, God uh, is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-seeing. Okay, good. And then he starts another logical argument. And he says, premise one, do we all agree that human beings lack full knowledge? Do we agree that human beings are not omni uh, omniscient? They don't know everything, and uh, people would say, yes, we are limited when it comes to uh, knowledge. Yes, we have limited knowledge. Do we agree that we don't have omnipotence? We're not omnipotent. We, we are not all, no, uh, all uh, you know, we, we are unable or unable to do stuff sometimes. They say yes. So he says, put the premises together, and you'll see that uh, um, whenever there is evil and whenever there is pain and whenever there is misery in the world uh, um, uh, he says that ah, I acknowledge that the, these things exist bad stuff, misfortunes happen and take place okay but because of your lack of absolute knowledge because of your lack of a absolute power you don't understand this is beyond your understanding. This is beyond your abilities. Okay? So this, this was his argument. God knows everything. Okay? God uh, is able, while human beings are um, neither able or uh, um, uh, kind of uh, omniscient. They don't know everything. So the conclusion would be, that God has better uh, plans for us and we don't have to worry if you see partial evil if you see an earthquake if you if you see a tsunami if you see people suffering if you see wars it doesn't mean that uh, God is not benevolent it's it's part of this grand scheme of things that you cannot understand because you're limited in knowledge and power are you getting the idea So, so this is how uh, Leibniz would explain it. Okay, so this is very rational, or this is what he thinks it is. And then comes, uh, then comes Alexander Pope, and he writes. Uh, he's a poet, and instead of kind of arguing with you like Leibniz did, and instead of establishing 
uh, it all using logic he would attack people in his poems and he would say you are limited who are you to judge uh, this um, cosmos and who are you to say that God uh, is perhaps not fair and uh, not benevolent okay again and he would also subscribe to the ideas of Leibniz and he would reiterate them saying that all uh, partial evil this is all partial partial means a part of a big picture that you cannot you cannot see because of how limited you are okay so the uh, the theory um, I mean this idea of uh, um, Le Leibniz uh, theories and how he explains it uh, um, these were uh, the most cited um, answers to the dilemmas uh, that people uh, would engage and uh, would talk about in the world uh, I mean the the problem of evil uh, the problem of pain and like I said Leibniz explained it um, uh, of course Voltaire would have a different viewpoint because he is an empirical philosopher and empiricism is uh, does not totally agree with uh, uh, rationalism empiricism is, is based on observation and on experimentation and sense experience you need to see stuff you need to feel stuff and experience stuff to accept it to, for your mind to accept it. so who would say listen Leibniz and Alexander Pope what you're saying is fine um, uh, you know rationally but uh, on the ground we have a different reality uh, we have a, a, a totally different reality that is even ugly people die uh, there are two tsunamis and there are um, you know uh, wars and earthquakes how would you account for that don't don't give me rational arguments give me solutions why is this happening okay so again uh, Voltaire's um, I mean points of departure would be uh, empirical rather than rational that's why he does not accept and of course the book is full of examples of just that suffice it to, to know for example that uh, um, if you read for example about the um, the earth the Lisbon uh, earthquake in in 1755 this was on a feast on a religious feast it's called the old saints feast so on a feast you have an earthquake and this earthquake is followed by a tsunami claiming lo the lives of uh, perhaps uh, 30 or um, or, f or f 40,000 people F uh, Voltaire would say give us us I mean give us give us an answer it's a feast it's a religious day where people are out celebrating and glorifying God and, and this is happening F uh, this is the kind of empiricism that I'm talking about as opposed to the rationalism of Leibniz and others <clears throat> okay so an example of how Voltaire exposes the limitations of Bangles's philosophy of optimism and by extension uh, Pope uh, and Leibniz's is during the dinner after the earthquake when he declares this is all for the best I mean this is Bangles is saying that this is I mean the earthquake and the tsunami afterwards are for the best for him for if there is a volcano beneath Lisbon then it cannot be anywhere else for it is impossible for things to be elsewhere uh, than where they are for all is well you see So in the context of the devastation caused by the earthquake, Bangles' uh, parroting of Pope's 
uh, and Leibniz creed of optimism comes across as especially uh, platitudinous. Uh, it's full of platitudes. Platitudes are, you know, uh, motos and slogans that are worthless to say, uh, worthless and inadequate to say the least. Again, um, Voltaire makes fun of uh, of the ideas of Leibniz and Pope in content by giving us examples of the miseries that people go through and also in his style. Okay. So uh, in terms of it, th the first thing that you would uh, uh, you know, perhaps uh, meet your eye and strike you would be the title of the um, uh, of the work of the book and also the the name of uh, the different characters. L like I said, the main character gives his name to the title. It's Can Candide. So you need to unpack what Candide means. Candide, like I said is uh, Candide is uh, um, honest, frank, um, and all these kinds of things. So again, he's being honest in the content by uh, present by uh, giving uh, us what actually happens in society and in the world. Uh, and by, by, by giving us that even with the names of the characters, whether we're talking about Candide or Kyonogon, their names have a great deal uh, of that, the idea of honesty, being brutal honest uh, in presenting what happens, whether w w what happens with you or with others. So the, even the style uh, is also... Um, more or less uh, part of the the the, um, the, the project the uh, the satirical project that uh, Voltaire is establishing here so the title of Candide is principally taken from the name of its protagonist but it applies equally well to its style so this book makes no effort to be civil. It's not a civil book. No, a civil means it is very forward in everything. It's very explicit, um, whether um, explicit on, on different levels, sexual and, and, and all the other facets. And even rejoices in its earthly rudeness. I mean, you can describe the book as being rude. And, uh, and it was on the list of banned, banned books at, at one point. It was banned. Remember, uh, uh, we spoke about that. Um, he had to um, kind of, I mean, I'm talking about Voltaire, in order to make sure that uh, people would have access to it, he has to publish it in, in three different countries at the same time. Uh, in France, I think in Geneva, and... Um, I don't know where, where at, uh, and in, uh, I think in England. So in three different places. Why would he publish it concurrently in three different places if it's, uh, it's, if it's a decent, nice, cute kind of work? It's not cute at all. It's full of, like I said, it's full of explicitness and, and, um, and uh, brutally honest uh, stuff. Um, obviously attacking the sensibilities of complacent individuals uh, and complacent uh, government governments and regimes so uh, Voltaire's candor is therefore integral to his message his target is the sort of moral dishonesty. I mean, he is targeting and he's attacking moral dishonesty 
which is uh, you know of course present in most ages and that does not flinch uh, i mean what he does does not flinch away from the facts i mean he presents things as they are he looks people in the eye and said that you are wrong you're corrupt you're dishonest okay okay um even Cunegonde, it's something that you wouldn't expect of a female to talk with uh, in this explicit uh, manner. But this is honesty, and then honesty uh, comes with a price, right? Uh, in order to show you uh, how tragic uh, the different situations are she has to um, to be honest she has she has to be um, again uh, brutally honest with you okay so actually we have different levels of honesty we have the brutal honesty of uh, candide and and Kionigan then uh, but you also are another level of honesty honest uh, diplomatic honesty that ex would exercise a great deal of tact tact to it and that would be uh, um, the narrative when uh, mr or dr ralph um, uh, takes it up you know when you read the novel that you're going to see the narrative oscillating between Ralph and uh, at one point Kionigan and uh, the old lady and so you don't have one single narrator and this is meant those variations in narrative would give you different levels of honesty so Ralph um, first of all is presented as being a German uh, narrator uh, and the the whole book is presented as uh, being taken or translated from German and this is meant to create a distance between uh, Voltaire and the authorities he does not want to impl implicate himself he knows that lots of people uh, and the authorities are going to attack him so he says no that this is German this is translated from German and in order to reinforce the impression uh, and enhance the impression that this is German, he has a German, German narrator by the name of Ralph. And Ralph would be complacent, would be presenting stuff in uh, a watered down way. I mean, he doesn't, um, you know, he, he doesn't exaggerate the miseries and the suffering or he, he doesn't even present them as they should be presented who takes this responsibility who takes it upon themselves to present truth as it is truth um, that is not uh, garnished that is not beautified it's Kionagan and the other two uh, narratives or narrators so the unworldly Dr. Ralph is not the only narrator in Candide there are three episodes in the novel recounted by women okay so chapter 8 for example is narrated by Candide's beloved Kionagun who retells the events of the opening chapter for, from her perspective uh, you, you then have chapters 11 and 12 and they are narrated by the old woman who tells Kionagun the story of her uh, I mean ca calamitous and uh, disastrous life and the first part of chapter 24 is narrated by uh, Beckett who disabuses Candide of his perception that she is happy by describing her decline from serving maid to prostitute again three women are given uh, the opportunity to narrate what happens to them and even to narrate parts that was narrated uh, previously by Dr. Ralph in order to see how different 
if narration is given from the perspective of a male and if uh, uh, narration is given from the perspective of women and not only women they are women who are victimized uh, women who had been uh, treated very unfairly there is obviously going to be a big difference uh, in these episodes uh, the episodes where women are the narrators uh, in these episodes told from a feminine perspective Voltaire gives us history from the point of view of its victims and this never happened okay so who are the victims here the victims are women so when women talk about their plight and their issues obviously they are better able to do that that than uh, if those issues are narrated by a male who doesn't feel their suffering who doesn't even share uh, their suffering sometimes i mean uh, we spoke about misogynist uh, writers misogynist mean women hating so you have uh, uh, a misogynist writer who wouldn't even say that this is uh, i mean they would simply say that uh, okay uh, they w uh, these are exaggerated stuff it never happened women are fine and they are doing good and okay but if women are given the opportunity to talk about their uh, and to talk about and share uh, what r they really feel w whether there are injustices whether there are uh, biases against them it would be a totally different type of narrative I promise you uh, so Voltaire gives us history from the point of view of its victims um, again uh, it's all uh, it will all come down to the idea of exposing as folds the unjustified uh, sense of uh, optimism that people like Pope and Leibniz uh, were promoting. Uh, in these three episodes narrated by female characters, Bangladesh's sanguine apathy is exposed as an overwhelmingly masculine delusion by the blunt facts of female subservience in a male dominated society this is what it is actually okay give them the opportunity to talk and you're going to have a totally different scenario a different scenario than the prescribed and the recommended scenario where everything is fine women live in the best of all possible uh, societies and worlds and all these kinds of blah 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 uh, so all three women tell tales of spectacular suffering and misadventure which are nonetheless lightened by their transparent absurdities and extravagant hyperbole you know it's extreme suffering extreme pain that they were feeling but you know with this uh, I mean Voltaire wouldn't get rid of his sense of humor even in the bleakest and the, the darkest of situations um, the, the plot is basically about um, uh, Candide's engaging in journeys uh, looking for Cunegonde this is the basic storyline <coughs> again when you w look at the the name of Cunegon it's it's uh, again it's pregnant with ideas and they all uh, point to this idea of um, honesty and um, uh, candor and all these kinds of things again Cunegon uh, has suffered a great deal and over time, I mean, you suffer, suffer, suffer. She, she's going to, I mean, lose a part of the beauty that she was known for. Uh, so, what we commonly regard as beautiful may also be quite obscene, 
or uh, what we commonly regard as obscene may in fact be quite beautiful so you, you I mean uh, Voltaire somehow turns ideas and concepts and conventions on their own heads And, and then we start to have examples from the novel and the focus as you can see is on how female characters relate or retell uh, their stories and I'm saying retell because we have perhaps heard them uh, by the main narrator Dr. Ralph again the perspective would be different with women um, it would be totally different So how much difference does it make that the narrator of this story is a woman? All the difference, I promise you. So uh, chapter A, as narrated by Kyonogand, is more or less like a flashback where it retells the events of chapters 2 to 7 from her own perspective as um, a woman. So as you can see, we have we have uh, um, the tale given to us uh, from the perspective of a female. Again, this would be at variance or different from uh, uh, what Dr. Ralph is saying and the way he says it as male. Um, the focus in 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 Kyonogon's Kion, narrative would be uh, uh, during the time when she was in Lisbon, and the time when she was Lisbon was the time when the earthquake uh, struck, uh, when the tsunami followed, when uh, you know there was also a war. So Kyonogen is recounting her story in Lisbon, which gives Voltaire a chance to portray the injustices meted out in this traditional Catholic society on four minorities. So at the time, together with the earthquake and the tsunami, there, were, there was a great deal of injustice, and this injustice was directed against minorities. So women would be a minority, the Jews where a minority protestant is uh, are a minority and also intellectuals intellectuals those who think outside the box they are not conformist they don't agree with uh, uh, tradition they don't conform to traditions 100 percent so these were four uh you know kind of uh, minorities that lisbon the catholic um, capital city uh, were um, doing injustice to. So her narrative involved journeys beginning in Westphalia. Westphalia is in Germany, where the assault on the Baron's castle is retold from the point of view of one of its female uh, victims. Um, again, you, uh, if we talk about minorities, um, uh, we talk about a pattern, we talk about an official pattern, um, we talk about an official life, uh, I mean hierarchy that all the members of society have to subscribe to and accept, which is the idea of the chain of being where you have to know where you are on the chain and you stick to your place on the hierarchy okay and the hierarchy has different barrels at different levels different corresponding uh, you know kind of barrels uh, on on the level of of the country or the kingdom you would have the king on top and then you go down Okay, on, on the level of society, w you would also have a hierarchy where man is on top and women comes after. Okay, 
on on the level of religions for example you would have a hierarchy on top would be catholicism in a catholic country and then protestantism and then uh, the jews and then muslims for example okay so society uh, does not operate away from philosophy and away from traditions as you can see so there is a religious a societal and a philosophical under uh, pinning that controls it all so you don't focus on individual and and, and separate incidents you focus on what gives rise to these situations okay like what is happening now in the US you don't focus on uh, on uh, on a cop or a policeman killing a black individual because it happens every day if you want to solve the problem you go to the uh, the philosophy behind it the philosophy behind it is that there is deep rooted uh, um, racism that controls the mindset of white Americans you go and work on that you you work on the philosophy and you don't work on its realizations and examples okay and this is actually what uh, our friend Voltaire is doing he gives you examples but he refers back uh, refers you back to uh, you know uh, the philosophy behind the example again what is interesting about Kjornagund is that she is supremely honest with what she says she even uh, when she she makes errors and mistakes I mean she 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 does acknowledge and admit them So Kionagin's candor is also directed at Voltaire's philosophical targets, and this is in uh, in direct contrast to Dr. Ralph. And um, again, she is very candid and she's very honest, and she seems to be saying, or she she all all, all the time attacks Bangles and his philosophy. And she declares that uh, um, he is utterly wrong. She says, Bangladesh deceived me cruelly after all when he told me that all is for the best in this world. Again, we go to the narrative as given by another female character, which is the old uh, woman. Uh, how she describes herself uh, um, as a girl uh, when she was in Morocco and the ordeals uh, and that she um, and the crises that she went through uh, and we also have um, the incident where the slave is also giving us his part of his sad part of the story Again, there is a, a great deal of comedy to it, but I um, mean, comedy shouldn't, you know, take away, take us away from uh, the original idea. I mean, the original idea, or the main uh, focus, or the focus would be on um, attacking this kind of uh, philosophy. You know, I mean, optimism and wha what comes with it. Again, we're going to be to have uh, some kind of comic, comic relief when we have this old lady uh, recounting uh, her experience. Of course, she's she's going to point to to the miseries, but in a, perhaps in a in a, a funny way. Uh, but uh, uh, Voltaire does not want us to uh, 
to uh, perhaps think of the book as mere um, you know comic book for he write away gives us um, another tragic tragic situation that would would involve um, a slave so uh, two or I mean double double purpose he has here he wants to tell us okay enough comedy we're going to go back to the main line which is obviously about the suffering and the misery of people due to those uh, um, atrocities and those injustices that are meted out the other purpose would be to give us his um, I mean, give us um, you know, some idea about how he hates uh, slavery and the institution of slavery. So his tone in the second passage is rather different. No comedy anymore. The slave recounts his sufferings from his, I mean, which started when his mother, his African mother, sold him on the coast of Guinea to his Dutch master in Suriname and this Dutch master would cut off his right hand and, and left leg. The slave's African mother and his Dutch owner both benefit by his enslavement but the slave declares himself to be a thousand times more miserable than dogs, monkeys and parrots. Yeah, that's true. Look at what happened to him. So Voltaire's tone here is far from comic. Instead, his satire assumes a serious edge in order to express unequivocally how much he abominates and hates slavery. So again, um, if you're talking about optimism and how sweeping and how rooted optimism is, you have to, in, your narrative has to be candid, even if it assaults the sensibilities of people. You have to be brutally honest. There is no avoidance of unpleasant facts. You tell it uh, as what it is. Or you tell it like what it is, like they say. So the female narrators, as well as the Dutch slave uh, in Suriname, are not in the slightest bit delicate when it comes to telling people about the cruelties perversive, perver per from pervasive, uh, or yes, and humiliations that have been their lot. They tell their histories throughout without unflinching honesty uh, uh, and candor. They tell it with candor and honesty. They don't beautify it. They don't dignify it. No, they give it as it should. Um, another journey perhaps a minor one that runs uh, parallel to the major journeys of uh, Candide and Kionagud would be Kakambo journey. Kakambo happens to be the valet or the servant of uh, Candide from uh, Latin America. Um, and Kakambo is going to uh, kind of accompany uh, can lead to the to the new world, and especially to the land of uh, El Dorado. We spoke about El Dorado and said it's the land where um, um, it's 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 how Voltaire and other others see uh, or imagine uh, a perfect world. Um, this is the land where people live. Um, to become hundred and even beyond. This is the land where uh, precious stones like gold 
uh, um, mean nothing uh, to people. This is obviously the land where there is uh, freedom of expression and and good good governance. Again, they would go there. They would be well received by the people there because the people there are innocent and nice and everything, and they have nothing to fear. They don't have the greed and the acquisitiveness of the old world. Okay, you have gold. Can we take some? Absolutely, take all you want. Uh, this is nice. Can I take it? Absolutely, take it. Okay, these people are very simple, are very innocent, and again, um, material, um, materialism and material cupidity mean nothing to them. Uh, again what is strange about this part is that Candida and Kakambu um, would decide to put a stop to this journey so instead of settling down in this island where there is perfect I mean order where there, where there is uh, peace and tranquility and and I mean they, they pretty much have whatever they need they strangely enough decided to go back and this is one of the contentions why would you have um, and, and this is critics talking to uh, Voltaire, w why would you have a perfect world if you're saying that um, we, we, we don't live in the best of all possible world? If you're debunking the myth that we're living in the best of all possible world. Okay? And now that you have a perfect world and those people reach this perfect world, why would they decide to, to go to the old world where there is a great deal of misery where there are uh, injustices and sufferings questions that people started to ask so two related contradictions seem to be present through throughout this passage first why in a work dedicated to the preposition that perfection is impossible why why should Voltaire have inserted an episode set in an environment that seemingly satisfies the most luxurious dreams of most people? Second, why I mean having established this haven of affluence, why should he cause his foot store travelers to head back to the continent that caused most of their dissatisfaction in the first place? Okay, so do we have an answer to that? Yes, absolutely. So the chapter amounts to a critique of value in which the ethical and material standards of the visitors are played off against those of their hosts. You have a trade-off. You have uh, uh, some kind of, you know, Pinary, pinary opposition between how the people of El Dorado l l look at stuff and and um, how the people of the old world, as uh, you know, as represented by um, Candide and Kakambu, look at stuff. There is the world views are totally different. And the example of the old man and how he looks at um, um, what what is happening. I mean, when he describes his house and and he he deep down believes that it is a modest house. He's not being humble or something. This is. And this is how this is 
how his value or his set of values are played out against those of uh, the old world again it may seem irony to us it may see, seem ironic to us people who live in the old world where gold means something where I mean material stuff means everything but for 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 this old man it's a totally different so you have a clash of values again uh, if you go back to the second question why why would uh, Kakambo and uh, what's the other guys name? can they decide to go why do they decide to go back home if they are enjoying everything again at simply they don't enjoy I mean the gold they don't enjoy the fact that they have gold all over the place because other people in the island are not having the same sentiment but they don't feel the pleasure of having something that other people don't have right but if they go back home if they go to the old world where gold is so important is so precious and they have it and other people don't have it they would enjoy it more and this is human nature okay so you you want a part of the human nature perhaps part of the philosophy of the old world that we live in is that we want to distinguish ourselves if we have something that uh, that uh, would set us apart from the rest that would uh, Give, give us uh, pleasure but if we don't have a privilege over others we don't feel anything so back in El Dorado they wouldn't have a privilege because I mean gold is accessible to everyone and nobody is thinking highly of, of it okay are you getting the idea that's why they insist that they go home in order to have this privilege of having gold over other people who don't have gold okay and uh, Candide says it all when he says Candide declares that if they leave El Dorado we shall be richer than all the kings put together we shall no longer have inquisitors to fear and we shall easily rescue Kyonagon. Uh, Amira is saying something. Doctor, this kind of reminds me of the Native Americans with the world, uh, with the explorers, especially the part about gold. That, that's true. Yeah. Uh, Amira, by the way, El Dorado, it, it is an imaginary island it does not exist of course but uh, it wa uh, it was in, in in Latin America okay so what you're saying is uh, correct okay it's it's based on incidents that uh, that that were actually happening between the Spaniards and the Portuguese when they first went to uh, to the New World and of course they have looted all the treasures of the people over there again they cannot settle down over there because these uh, treasures mean nothing to the natives but if they take them to Spain or Port uh, Portugal it would make all the difference for them okay so what's the implication why would we have 
a perfect world when uh, um, you are lamenting yeah voltaire you're lamenting the the loss and the absence of values in uh, in the old world the implication of Candide's and Cacambo's experience of El Dorado is that there are plenty of worlds that are better. They are just unrealizable. Unreali this is then utopia, and of course, by definition, utopia means a perfect and non-existent place. Again, we move to the idea, and this is also one of the very important ideas uh, in, in this work, the idea of fate or free will. Obviously, we're talking about countries and the countries of the old world, like Portugal um, and Germany. I mean, they had enjoyed um, at the time a relatively... Um, uh, high level of perhaps democracy and freedom. Uh, we're talking about a time, perhaps after the the um, the reformation of Martin Luther, where people have had to decide for for themselves. They don't. They are no longer under the grip of the Catholic Church. They can now, for the first time, perhaps think for, for themselves. Again, so you have free will, you can think for yourself. Um, but the next thing we know about you is that you are uh, um, engaging in wars, engaging in sectarian violence between the Protestants um, and the Catholics, uh, which claimed the lives of thousands of people. So this is free will. Um, uh, Voltaire is toying with the idea of perhaps we can try different cultures where there is no free will, no freedom of choice, where there is faith and predestination. And that's why the last part of the book will be, or perhaps the, the last leg of the journey will be in Constantinople, Turkey, modern day Turkey. Uh, and the choice of Turkey is very significant because we're talking about uh, um, Constantinople, which, which, is, which was Muslim, a Muslim city. And as a Muslim city, there is a great deal of faith involved. People normally, uh, you know, resign to, to the will of God. They accept their faith with diligence. They never question uh, uh, when it comes, for example, to uh, death and tragedies. They never question the wisdom of God. They say, oh, this is God's will and we honor and respect God's will because if we exercise patience, we're going to be rewarded in the hereafter. But Voltaire comes and says, listen, we have tried the West for quite some time. We have tried Catholicism and Protestantism and with this uh, perhaps slim measure of free will. Why don't we go to the w to the east, and the east is known for its fatalism. Uh, people are governed and controlled by fate. They respect and honor fate very. Perhaps we can have a solution to the problems that we have back in the west. Okay. So it is significant that C Candide and his band of travelers conclude their journeys in Turkey 
a region that was still dominated by the declining Ottoman Empire. And of course, I mean, for the West, and uh, it was known as a despotic uh, empire. Despotic means that it is, uh, and the rule over there is absolute. You have only one ruler, and uh, obviously, people are um, the people don't have a say in what is happening. It's not a democratic empire or country. He says, why don't we try that? They are controlled by fate and they are also controlled by the rulers. So let's go and see how they live their life. Perhaps they have a better scenario. Perhaps they have a better solution to the issues that we have back in Europe. Um, I'll I'll stop on this note and with this item, and when we meet again, inshallah, I'll finish it off. I mean, we still have you know, the 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 part remaining is very small. Um, okay, I'll give you a minute if you have any questions before we conclude uh, this class. Um, okay, thank you so much. It has been a real pleasure having you this morning.